Welcome to The Well Woman Show. Each episode is a transformational journey using mindfulness, feminism, leadership, and strategy to support you to thrive personally, generate wealth, and impact your community. I'm not like this sick, lazy person that I think some of my doctors think that I am or the few people that know that I'm sick that secretly believe, like, I'm going to prove them all wrong. And now, here's your host, feminist thought leader, London School of Economics grad, leadership consultant, and transformational coach, Giovanni. Anna Rossi. Well, hello, well women. Great to have you back. Um, this week, I'm going to be talking to Sarah Ramey, who is a writer and has um, overcome major chronic illnesses. And I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a minute. But before we get started with that, I want to remind you that you can join us over in the Facebook group, wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook. Um, to have some of these difficult conversations and get input and feedback from other women working on their well woman life, um, especially around the well woman framework. So if you're new to the show, I want to welcome you and just let you know that you can go learn more about the framework we use here uh, at wellwomanlife.com slash quiz. You take, you answer two quick questions and then you get to find out where you are in the framework. You'll be in one of four stages. And in each stage, we provide you tools to access the superpower that can be found in that stage. That's just waiting for you to use it to kind of move through the cycle and really find your flow and get what you want in life and make an impact and do all of the things that you're trying to do in the world. Um, you know, as well as, uh, wanting good health and, um, you know, relationships and things for ourselves and to grow our career and our business. We're also, up to something else here. Well, women are really making an impact in the world. We're changing lives. We're changing the world in small ways, in big ways, in all kinds of ways. And so you're here, you found this show because that is what you're up to. And this particular um, framework that I share really is developed to support smart women who are out there changing the world and are having some challenges with it, right? Because it's challenging doing all of this and keeping it all together and doing everything we need to do and being who we need to be. So I want to welcome you to the show. Welcome you back to the show. If you've been a listener for a long time, Um, definitely head over to uh, iTunes and leave a review. I would love to see your reviews. I'm going to be reading those out um, on the air here. So that's uh, iTunes. Yeah, iTunes reviews. You can find that on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. Just uh, leave a review in there and um, definitely come over and uh, hang out with us in the Facebook group, wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook. And the Well Woman Show is thankful for support from Natural Awakenings Magazine in New Mexico and High Desert Yoga in Albuquerque. Okay, so on to the show. This is a fascinating conversation. This week, I talked to Sarah Ramey, survivor of chronic illnesses, and a writer living in Washington, D.C. She's just released her first book, The Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illness. She has an MFA in creative nonfiction writing from Columbia, and she worked on President Obama's 2018 campaign. And on top of all of that, she's a musician. On the show, we talk about how Sarah fought to overcome her illness and prove that she wasn't weak or crazy, the lack of support in our healthcare system for her invisible illness and other invisible illnesses in general. I hear this a lot from women. And also we talk about why society needs to take an empathetic approach to healthcare as we move forward. All the information shared today can be found at the show notes at wellwomanlife.com slash 202 show. And again, as I said earlier, come over and hang out with us in the Facebook group. We're having lots of conversations and deep dives into what it is to be a smart woman changing the world, 
uh, with all of these challenges. So um, I hope you enjoy this show. I'm speaking with Sarah Ramey. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Sarah, it's great to have you on the show. I want to just start by um, having you tell listeners, who are you in the world today? <laughs> so in the world today, let's say the defining feature is that I'm, I'm in the world again. <laughs> I've been kind of out of the world for a long time because I've been uh, so sick um, with uh, a series of, uh, quote, mystery illnesses that kept me you know, mostly housebound and, and bedridden for quite a long time. And, um, but I've been doing uh, better in the last couple of years. And so uh, now I'm a little bit more out and about in this book coming out. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's sort of who I am. Okay, so kind of reappearing, re, re-emerging, it sounds like, uh, into the world after dealing with this long series of, of illnesses. And as we heard in the introduction, your book is called The Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illness. And I just love the title, first of all. Um, I feel like we all need a handbook for, for life, really. But uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's hopefully kind of what this show is, actually. Um, yeah. But as far as your book goes, uh, without you know retelling the whole story, just sort of, can you summarize what it is that you are um, trying to tell people with this book? Yeah, so the book is about, um, it's, a, it's about my story of becoming uh, really quite sick. Uh, my final year of college with a mystery illness, I had this uh, sort of uh, botched surgical procedure. I became septic, and then I sort of fell into this black hole of just extreme fatigue and hurting, and extreme pain and gastrointestinal problems. And for a long time, I I really thought that I was, you know, the only person this had ever happened to. I went to so many doctors. Uh, my parents are both physicians, and so we just really, really did the best that anybody could do to get to the bottom of it, and could not figure it out, could not find any diagnoses. And uh, what started to happen was that in the absence of uh, a diagnosis or any of the tests saying, here's what you, here's what you have, um, what started to happen was that, you know, doctor after doctor started to tell me, well, since your tests don't say anything, then that, that can only mean one thing. That means that this is, you know, psychosomatic or, or all in your mind. And so, th- so obviously that was... Uh, bad. And for a long time, I really thought that that was A, true, and B, that that it was just me, that, that there was something wrong with me. Um, but then I, uh, after a few years, I started to meet my first, I, I call people like us Womies, it's a, a woman with a mysterious illness. And I met my first Womie, and she's telling me her story, and it's like a carbon copy of my own story, and I couldn't believe it. I thought it was like the, the a miracle that I had met somebody that was just like me. And then shortly after that, I met somebody else, another carbon copy, and then another and another. And I began to realize that there's actually this sort of subterranean um, uh, society of people like me with the mysterious illnesses. So those are like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. The, the, you, later you get diagnoses like Lyme or chronic fatigue syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia, et cetera. And what a, an autoimmune. So, yeah, and, and autoimmune diseases. So so in the case of autoimmune diseases, it there's a lot of overlap, A, with the symptoms, but also you it's really common to to sort of bounce around and around from doctor to doctor for a long for years before you actually get a diagnosis. Um, and so it's this big family of sort of neuroendocrine immune problems that all kind of travel together comorbidly, but they all get treated the same way in the medical system, which is that either being told that they're not serious um, and to not worry about it so much, or that it's just not happening at all and that you need to, you know, seek psychiatric counseling. And so what the book is about is about that. And it's about, it sort of uses my story, but also really the story of, of learning, meeting all of these people, and then doing the work to read 
what the data says and to look at the science of well, what is actually going on because it's not that there's a secret society of women that's all making up you know this uh, colorectal uh, fatiguing vagina problems like that's that's not a thing that's happening and and so the the book is really about trying to unpack at the very least just what is known not solving it completely but just uh talking about what is known but if the doctors are misdiagnosing or not diagnosing presumably that's because there is no data because women are have been excluded from uh serious medical clinical trials and other kind of research or are you saying that there is data that they just aren't using yeah so there's definitely uh, a real lack of data, but there's not no data. Mm. Um, there, the so for example, chronic fatigue syndrome is the best example of this. Um, for diseases like cancer, AIDS, it's the funding that you that we put aside for those is in the many billions of dollars, about six billion for each each of those groups. For chronic fatigue syndrome, it's 14 million. And that's, I know it's when you get into these big numbers, it's hard to visualize, but it's if those were on the same graph, like the 14 million wouldn't even register. It's at the bottom of all diseases studied at uh, at the NIH. And so, but, but that isn't to say that it's not being studied at all. So in the case of chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, just in the last, I think, four or five years, there are at least 72 small studies, but studies that have been done, and they all show that something is wrong. And so ju- just at a, at a baseline, there shouldn't be physicians anymore that say, I don't, I don't buy it. I, I don't think that that's real. That's, we're, we're past that in terms of uh, the scientific understanding of what's going on, but that doesn't mean that we know uh, exactly what's going on. Mm. Okay, so I want to break this up a little bit because I want to hear more about what you found. But just to go back into the data, so then if there is some data, albeit, you know, not a lot, but there is some, is the problem that we're not teaching it in medical school or is the problem that doctors are not keeping up to date with current research? I think it's the the former. I think it's that, uh, I think I saw a recent study that showed that 90% of medical school graduates don't receive any training in chronic fatigue syndrome. So you can understand that a doctor would not, uh, you know, they, 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 they would think that there's no data. They're not being trained in the data. Um, but but I do think it's a little bit of, of the latter as well. I do think that there's enough now that doctors should be aware that this is a real problem, even though, you know, it's not, uh, the the understanding is not particularly sophisticated. There's just more than enough evidence, but also just the overwhelming collective anecdotal evidence from patients that's all exactly the same. And the the level of suffering that's being described is to a degree that it, it, it's just, to my mind, it's just unconscionable to turn away from that and say, no, I don't buy it. Right. Right. Okay. So Sarah, you spent many years being really quite ill and trying to discover, you know, what the problem was going to see many, many doctors and specialists. And uh, your parents are also doctors and you've got a medical sort of family, people in the, in your family, in that field. Um, And you say in your book, Uh, There comes a point when you decide that if it's going to be so outrageously bad on the inside, you will try to create something outrageously good on the outside. What were you doing there? Uh, I can so relate to that. And I think so many women who listen to this show can relate to that. What was happening there? Yeah. So (laughs) it's interesting that that is something that that is extremely common, but it's but it's also it, it's not possible once you get to the to the severest end of the spectrum of these problems. Like you can't that that no longer is an option to to pretend. But but, but you can happens, for a long time. You can for a very long time. Yeah. You can. I was extremely sick, and I basically just absolutely pretended like I wasn't, and just locked it all in the basement. I would get up every day, put my makeup on, put on a nice outfit. I did not talk to anybody at all about my 
health problems. Um, it was at sort of the beginning of kind of defecting from traditional medicine over into alternative medicine. And I was just starting to read about, you know, your, your, how your thoughts influence your physiology and that I was going to think positively. And so I got really, really into that. And I, uh, <laughs> this is right after I had gone uh, to a, a writing program uh, in New York. And right after that, um, uh, there was a job came up at the Obama campaign. This is back in, in 2007. <laughs> I, I was really sick. There was no, it was insane to apply for that job. But in my mind, I was like, this is what's going to cure me. I'm going to go do this thing that like, I really, that brings me joy. That is like an impressive thing to do. I'm not like this sick, lazy person that I think some of my doctors think that I am, or the few people that know that I'm sick that secretly believe, like, I'm going to prove them all wrong. And so I took this job that, in retrospect, was a crazy job to take. But but I did it because I wanted to, I wanted to prove myself wrong. I wanted to prove everybody else wrong, that, that, I, that, that I wasn't weak and that the illness wasn't um, some sort of reflection on my my person on my character and I think that that's really 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 common and I think it's we have so little support uh infrastructurally sort of set up around these illnesses there isn't when you get one of these problems it's extremely rare for people to say oh my god I'm so sorry what can I do can I bring you a casserole like that does not happen and so you start to associate your illness with shame because people are pretty shaming of a lot of these problems and so you just do everything you can to hide it away and to be strong and to be valiant and to have you know be perfect and I think that that there's a lot of overlap there with just like being a female (laughs) but I think that that it certainly happens when you also have one of these illnesses Mm. okay and then now in the uh time of coronavirus it's almost like it's the opposite. It's so outrageously yes. it's so outrageously bad on the outside that we're all creating something good on the inside in our homes and in our hearts and minds. Do you yeah. have a comment about that? I was just thinking about that this morning. It's it is a it is amazing to me to because what I've seen all around me, and, and maybe this is just the the type of people that I'm around, but everyone around me accepts that we are in a time of trauma and that there is like a hundred percent sort of support and acceptance around this. Everybody says like, you know, make sure that you are taking care of yourself. It's okay if you are feeling, you know, tired and lethargic and need to take some time for yourself, take care of your body, take care of your soul. Like that's a lot of the messaging that I hear around me, which I think is correct, but it's amazing that that's what happens when the trauma is uh, visible and it's shared and it's not stigmatized. It is something that is, um, I don't want to say valorized, but it, it is something that's quite real that we all know that we're going through. It's the opposite of something that people are saying, no, that's that's made up, that's uh, psychosomatic, that's uh, you know, you know, some sort of elaborate plan to get out of, you know, participating in life. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a completely different response. I think it's the correct response. It's the right, it's the response that I wish people would have when they started to become sick with the mystery illnesses, that it was immediately, um, everybody gathered around that person to say, you, we're going to help you to, to slow down, to take care of yourself, to uh, to, to find the physicians that can help you, that can get to the bottom of this, to do everything that we can to take care of you during this time of, of pain and suffering. That's the appropriate <laughs> response. And right. yeah, that didn't happen. And, <laughs> and that doesn't happen under, under the old way of being in the world. And I, and I do think that we're at an opening, we're at a crossroad yeah. where we can either, um, you know, say, yes, things are different, and we're going to pursue that and really lean into that. Or are we just kind of like treading water and waiting for it to go back to the way it was? I think it's so interesting. I think it's really important to talk about and to make it as visible as possible that we are in this moment of opening into a more empathetic way of being kind of a 
also something I found is that empathy is is often just a byproduct of experiencing suffering yourself. And so now we're having this very rare moment where everyone is suddenly like really uh, scared and suffering and experiencing this. And so I think it's good and important to talk about to people who, you know, once this is all over, will be able to return to basically a normal semblance of life to make sure that we're having the conversation with everybody that's like, but don't forget what that was like, because there's a lot of people who that's just their life. That's just their life. Somebody with a chronic illness, like it's it's very similar. They're stuck inside all the time. Their job has gone up in a puff of smoke. They live in fear of economic ruin. The government isn't doing enough to uh, study the problem. There are no tests. You know, it's very, very similar. And so I, I, I'm very uh, passionate about making sure that those conversations are happening so that it's harder to uh, ignore some of these problems once this is all gone. Yeah, I mean, what a timely, what a time to have your book come out, right? On the one hand, it's like, <laughs> it, it's probably hard for you because you're trying to get your uh, voice heard in, in this crazy time. And on the other hand, it's a great time for you to be telling these stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. It's it's definitely both of those things. It's like very on brand to be uh, bumped by a real illness. <laughs> But it's also, uh, it, it is also very helpful to be able, because a lot of times I think when you talk about suffering people, it's so painful for people. And I really do understand that, that they just, they, they just cannot open up to it. And they, they, they hear you talking, but they just can't take it in. But when, but when they are experiencing it, all of a sudden people really do, they're like, oh, this is what you meant about being stuck inside all the time. You're right. It, it's horrible. Whereas I had a lot of people where I would say, you know, I'm, they would say, how are you? And I'd say, well, actually, I'm, I'm pretty much homebound. And they'd be like, oh, well, I wish I could work from home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a lot of people said that to me. And so it's, it's I think, important to have this, this moment of like, oh, well, like you meant that. Yeah. So in your book, you say caring for herself, she's a little surprised to learn, is a radical act. What do you mean there? It's actually really interesting to me. Wellness and the concept of self-care and just the health movement in general, just in the last couple of years has moved so quickly into the mainstream. And I'm, I'm so happy to see that, like a program like this, like there's, there. Because for a long time, talking about wellness was this like fringe sort of woo-woo behavior. And to an extent, it still is. But Yes, yes, I will say. Yeah, I, yes. I've, I've been talking about it for a long time. <laughs> yes. And it's, I don't know if you feel this way, but I really have noticed like a real shift just in the last couple of years where just it's people that I never would have dreamed are just like talking about self-care as if it's like they've been talking about that all their life. And I'm like, I, I haven't. But, but I think that um, for, for a really long time, um, there has been just this cultural norm to, to push yourself to extremes, to wear stress as a badge of honor, to wear your sleeplessness as a badge of honor, your busyness as a badge of honor, uh, you're juggling everything and doing it all and multitasking and all of these things as like a, a signal that like you're that's that's what makes you a successful uh, woman or human being in the world. And I think that we are really just over you know part part of what I think drives the mystery illnesses is that it is this um, just unrelenting uh, sort of onness and never allowing yourself to be off and. And it's not healthy. We, you know, we know that, but studies show that, that, you know, productivity goes up when you give people more time off and, you know, encourage them to rest and take care of themselves like that. That's what makes you a more successful person. But we, I think, have really kind of gotten it wrong for a long time. And so it's, I'm glad to see that it is changing, but it, but it's still, it is radical in a lot of ways to take that stand for yourself, that it's not selfish, that it's not indulgent, that it's important that you take care of yourself and pay attention to your own health and well-being because that's what that's what really helps the people around you. If you're completely worn out all the time, if you're completely martyred, you're not you're not 
much use to the people around you. And so it's very important, I think, to to practice a lot of uh, self-forgiveness around the idea that that you're going to take care of yourself and that that's important and that that's, that is like a worthwhile, uh, I don't want to say heroic, we talk a lot about heroines versus heroes in the book, but, but it, is a, it is a noble thing to do to take care of yourself and your own health. Yes. And uh, self-care, I think, has become such a main stream term now, as you've said, that it, it can be misunderstood. And so what I try to do on the Well Woman show is really dig into that and say, okay, what what is it that we're talking about? Is it going to get mm. a manicure once a month? Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> is it going, is it like spending a lot of money on a fancy spa day for your birthday? It can be, and it's awesome to do those things. But really what we're talking about is prioritizing your needs on a daily basis. And what does that look like? Like, What does that mean for you to prioritize your needs and to claim the word selfish? I do a whole thing on that, reclaiming the word selfish. But anyway, I I just want the message about self-care really to be about, you know, how, how can we prioritize our needs? And you must have had to do that in dealing with everything that you dealt with, with your mysterious illness. Yeah. And actually something that you said, I think is really important is that, you know, when especially when you're you're just trying to take care of yourself and you're just trying to feel better, you do kind of initially reach for a lot of the things like a manicure or a massage or like uh, if you can afford those things to 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 feel immediately better. But one of the things that I, I feel really strongly about is that the, the, the self-care things that really matter are some of these foundational things like eating real food, getting enough sleep, moving your body, the things that are actually kind of harder initially to... Um, make a part of your life like it doesn't feel like self those things don't feel like self-care in the beginning they feel hard yeah but they I I think that and and, and I wouldn't ever push anyone to do something that's actually making them feel worse like if you've got severe chronic fatigue syndrome exercise is definitely out but but I do think that a lot of those things like um it it takes an initial investment of, of time and energy and money but those things really do for a huge number of people once you actually get over the the hump of the of change that those are the things that really actually make you feel better and are worth that time and that that investment and that i talk about this all the time but like the thing the 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 way that i think you need to measure Sarah Ramey, author of the Ladies' Handbook for her like how, how much your self care is working. Right it's just back. how you feel. It's it's not how you look. It's not how much you weigh. It's not. It has nothing to do with beauty. Like it's how you feel. Like do you feel energetic? Do you feel rested? Do you feel you know like you want to engage with the world? And that those should be the metrics that you're like going by. And I think we're really really uh, accustomed to using a whole other set of metrics like how much we weigh, what we look like, how beautiful full we are how if we're getting the glow or not from like our diet or whatever and i just i think that those those can become really like self-punishing and so your your brain is like wired to move away from that eventually if you're actually just punishing yourself and so whatever you do it really just needs to be about doing the things that are actually making you feel better and i think that's kind of individual from person to person i'm speaking with I'm so thankful for support from Natural Awakenings Magazine in New Mexico, a monthly green, healthy lifestyle publication, and for support from High Desert Yoga, promoting optimum physical health, clarity of mind, and spiritual inspiration for all. Many of you have followed my journey from consulting to women's leadership and empowerment, starting a nonprofit, raising two kids, and everything in between. I've really taken some time this year to focus in on where I can help the most women with their own desire to create social impact and also a good income for themselves and their families. As my consulting and coaching practice is growing, I found that one of my favorite things to do is the free discovery sessions. I love hearing about people's passions for the work they do, sharing what I do, and helping people understand what my hybrid consulting coaching is all about. Hint, hint, serious strategy plus spacious mindset. So if you find yourself worrying about whether you'll ever make it in the thing you're pursuing or waking up in the middle of the night anxious about money, 
lacking energy you need to get everything done, or procrastinating on moving forward with projects and tasks, or even if you're in a leadership role, but you're second guessing yourself and not getting things done, I'd love to talk to you. These conversations help me get clearer on how I can help more leaders create the impacts and income they want so they can start living with ease and joy. Plus, you'll get a free hour with me to get crystal clear on what you want to create for your company or organization and your life and what's been holding you back. So if you're interested, you can book a call at wellwomanlife.com slash learn more. We're back on the Well Woman Show with the Superpowers for Success segment. I'm speaking with Sarah Ramey. Sarah, I'm going to ask you a few quick questions. Uh, it's a kind of a quick round here to end the show. And the first question is, what does success in life mean for you? At this point for me, success is about uh, the strength of my connection to the people around me, to my work, just a sense of connectedness because I spent so long feeling so disconnected and so cut off from the world. And so now it feels, what, what feels the best to me is to feel really connected to my work, to feel really connected to the people around me. It's, it's actually been amazing in the time of COVID-19. I've, <laughs> I've never been so connected to the people around me. And just because everybody is checking in and everybody's doing all of these uh, online things to connect to one another. And I I would, I've talked to a lot of people who are Wami's women with mysterious illnesses, and we've talked a lot about how, you know, we're going to take these things forward with us, you know, after all of this. And, and so that, that feels really good to me. And so, yeah, maintaining that sense of connectedness as like a daily practice that I have to do, but that is really rewarding, that, that feels successful to me. Okay. And when did you know you were really good at what you do? I think, you know, I actually have this really incredible agent and my agent is the person that whose feedback always she just always has the sort of the feedback that feels the most correct and whether something is good or bad and and anytime I give something to her when it comes to writing but also with my music and and uh, it comes back as a as a as a success I feel I feel really good Mm, okay and so Sarah, can you describe a personal habit that contributes to your own well-being now? Uh, yeah. So I, um, uh, so I have chronic fatigue syndrome, which is usually, it's not indicated that we should exercise at all. But for me, exercising a little bit really, really helps me. But I have to do it um, at night so that I don't uh, cause, a, it's called a crash. And so every night, uh, right before I go to bed, actually, I just do a little bit of exercise and it makes a tremendous impact on the way that I wake up the next morning, uh, and the way that I feel overall. It's Again, it's just a little bit because if I do too much, it uh, has a sort of rebound effect. But mm. yeah, that's something I do every night and feels feels really good. What superpower did you discover you had only to realize it was there all the time? Songwriting. I, I'm also a musician and a uh, after a long period of being inside with nothing to do with myself, I, I finally started, um, I'd always been a singer, and but I'd never, I had always written poetry, and I'd always sort of thought about songwriting, but I'd never really tried. And um, yeah, I, I, at some point when I was living in San Francisco, I started, I picked up a guitar, taught myself to play all these Leonard Cohen songs, and then started to write songs. And that, um, that that's been one of the things that has helped me the most, because that's always been something I can do almost no matter what, no matter how sick I am. Yeah. Okay. What advice would you give yourself uh, when you were younger, like your younger self 10 or 15 years ago? It's definitely just some of these basic, you know, quote, wellness things of eating real food. Don't take antibiotics if you don't have to. Uh, Get enough sleep. Don't, you know, burn the candle at both ends and move your body and connect to your friends and just take those things as seriously as you would take anything else in your life because it's not woo-woo and it, it really matters. It's it's the most strengthening thing that you can do for yourself. Okay. Sarah, do you identify as a feminist? Yeah. What does that mean for you? Um, for me, I mean, it's certainly about, you know, fighting for, you know, equality for women. Um, but it's also, I talk about this a lot in the book. I also feel like it's very important to advocate for any differences there are between men and women or just difference in general, just whatever your differences are 
to make sure that those are valued and not there isn't a hierarchy of, oh, we value these these values, either if they're masculine or feminine. We value the masculine ones, but not the feminine ones. I think it's really important to make sure that that we're not all That equality is not just about being the same. It's about valuing uh, all of these traits in all of us in the ways that they show up naturally. And that's, for me, is a part of feminism. Mm. Okay, last question for you. What are you reading right now? What's on your nightstand? Uh, A friend of mine, Nick Jaina, just wrote a book called Hitomi, and I just got it in the mail yesterday. So I'm I'm reading that. But I also just started uh, Where the Crawdads Sing, which has been recommended many times and uh, I'm enjoying both of those so far. Okay. We'll link to those in our show note. We love to share what people are reading. And uh, Sarah Ramey, author of The Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illness. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. That's it for our show today. Remember, if you need support to live your well woman life, head over to wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook to join our community. As a reminder, we are on NPR every week. So be sure to tune in at npr.org slash podcasts and search for The Well Woman Show. If you enjoy enjoyed today's show, please take a moment and subscribe and leave a review. This helps raise visibility, which is super helpful when it comes to producing the show every week. For feedback, comments, or just to let me know you were listening, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Well Woman Life. I'm Giovanna Rossi for The Well Woman Show. Until next time, have a super powerful week.